On the southernmost main Japanese island of Kyushu, the small city of Saga lies midway between two major centers, which in recent years have become well known to thousands of Americans. At Sasebo, the United States Navy based most of its fleet which participated in the Korean War. From the airfield runways at Ashia, American fighters and bombers took off for flights over narrow Tsushima Strait to attack the Chinese and Red Koreans on the disputed peninsula. Saga City is no newcomer to military expeditions across Tsushima Strait. My own ancestors were members of the Japanese forces, which in 1592 invaded Korea from Saga. Nor is the unpleasant outcome of the modem Korean conflict without its precedent. The medieval Korea-Japan War choked to a stalemate in 1597, after the Ming Dynasty of China threw its strength onto the side of the North Koreans, just as modern Red China has brought about the current Korean impasse. Thus, my family has a warrior's origin, and for many years my forebears served faithfully the feudal lord of Saga until, under a government centralization plan in the 19th century, he committed his estate to the emperor's keeping. In the feudal times, when four castes divided the Japanese people, my family enjoyed the privilege of the ruling class known as the samurai, or warriors. Aloof from the mundane problems of everyday life, the samurai lived proudly, without personal concern for such matters as income, and devoted their time to local government administration and to constant preparedness for emergencies which would make demands upon their fighting prowess. The samurai's living necessities were underwritten by his lord, regardless of farm depressions or other outside influences. The 19th century abolition of the caste system proved a crushing blow to the proud samurai people. In a single stroke, they were stripped of all their former privileges and forced to become merchants and farmers, and to adopt patterns of life under which they were ill-suited to prosper. It was to be expected that most of the samurai became destitute, struggling to eke out a living through the most menial labour or through dawn-to-dusk work on their small farms. My own grandfather fared no better than his friends. He finally accepted a small farm on which he struggled bitterly to scratch out the necessities of life. My family was then, and is today, one of the very poorest in the village. It was on this farm that I was born on August 26, 1916, the third of four sons. My family also included three sisters. Ironically, my own career closely paralleled that of my grandfather, when Japan surrendered to the Allies in August of 1945. I was at the time the leading live ace of my country, with an official total of 64 enemy planes shot down in aerial combat. With the war's end, however, I was dismissed from the defunct Imperial Navy and barred from accepting any government position, was penniless and with no skill I could employ to adapt myself to a world which had crashed all about me. Like my grandfather, I lived by dint of the crudest manual labour. Only after several years of bitter struggle did, I managed to save enough to set up a small printing shop to serve as a means of livelihood. The task of tilling the one-acre household farm near Saga City fell heavily on the shoulders of my mother, who also had the problem of tending her seven children. To add to her unceasing labours, she was widowed when I was eleven years old. My memories of her at that time are of a woman steadfastly at work, my youngest sister strapped to her back as she bent over for hour upon hour in the fields, toiling under brutal conditions. But at no time do I recall hearing any complaint pass her lips. She was one of the bravest women I have ever known, a typical samurai, proud and stem, but not without a warm heart when the occasion demanded. I sometimes returned home from school, whimpering after having been thoroughly beaten by older and larger schoolboys. She had no sympathy for my tears, only scowls and admonishing words. Shame on you, was her favourite retort. Do not forget that you are the son of a samurai, that tears are not for you. In the village primary school I worked hard at my studies and throughout the six years remained at the head of all my classes. But the future presented apparently insuperable problems to my further education. While the primary schools were government financed, the majority of the more advanced institutions required the student to be supported by his family. This arrangement was, of course, impossible for the Sakai family, 
which barely met its needs for food and clothing. However, we had not reckoned with the generosity of my uncle in Tokyo, who offered, incredibly, to underwrite all my school expenses. He was a successful official in the Ministry of Communications, and his offer included adoption and a complete education. We gratefully accepted our good fortune. In all Japan, the feudal clan of Saga occupied one of the poorest of the self-sustaining provinces. Its samurai class had for ages lived an austere life and was famous for its Spartan discipline. We were the only province in all the land, which lived religiously by the Bushido Kodi Hagakure, the main theme of which was, Samurai lives in such a way that he will always be prepared to die. Hagakure during the war became a textbook for every school in the country, but it was the code under which I had always lived, and its severity served me well, both in my new school life and in the years to follow in combat. Everything in Tokyo bewildered me. I had never known a city larger than Saga, with its 50,000 people. The milling throngs in Japan's capital were incredible, as were the constant turmoil, the noise, the large buildings, and all the activities of one of the world's greatest centres. I was also to find that Tokyo in 1929 was a stage of fierce competition in every field. Not only were new graduates competing bitterly for jobs, but even the young children had to fight for the comparatively few openings in the select schools. I had thought my life on the farm difficult. I had thought myself exceptional as the leading student of my school for six entire years. But I had never encountered school children who studied literally day and night, who crammed every available moment in order to beat out their fellow students. The select Tokyo high schools, such as the Tokyo First or the Tokyo Fourth, all chose their entrance from the outstanding students of the primary schools. Furthermore, of every 35 applicants, only one received admission. It was clearly out of the question for a country boy such as myself, bewildered as I was with this strange and tempestuous atmosphere, even to aspire for enrolment in these famed schools. I accepted gladly a student's place in the Ayama Gakuin, established years before by American missionaries. Not equal in reputation to the better-known institutions, it was not, however, without repute. My new home life could not have been better. My uncle, however, was overly serious and of the opinion that the less seen or heard of children, the better. This was not the case with my aunt or her son and daughter, who could not have been kinder or more friendly. Under these pleasant circumstances I began high school, burning with ambition and enthusiasm, fully determined to retain always my comfortable place at the head of the class. It took less than a month for these dreams to vanish. My expectations of again leading all the students were rudely shattered. It was obvious, not only to my teachers but to myself as well, that many of the other boys never leading students in their primary schools bested me in studies. I found this difficult to believe, yet they knew many things of which I was totally ignorant, Despite desperate studying into all hours of the night, I was unable to learn as quickly as the others. The first semester ended in July. My school reports, which placed me in the middle of the class, were a heavy disappointment to my uncle and the cause of despair for me. I knew that my uncle had accepted all my expenses because he felt I was a promising child and could maintain student leadership. There was no denning his unhappiness at my failure, summer vacation therefore became a period of intense home study. While my classmates went on their holidays, I crammed through the summer months, determined to make up my scholastic deficiencies. But the opening of the school year in September proved the futility of my efforts. There was no improvement. These repeated failures to gain scholastic prominence caused a feeling of sheer desperation, not only had I become merely average in my studies, in sports as well, I found myself outclassed. There could be no doubt that many of the boys in the school were more agile, more capable than myself. The disillusioned state which followed was unforgivable, instead of continuing the attempt to surpass those students who had clearly indicated their scholastic superiority. I chose friends of mediocre abilities. I lost no time in asserting leadership over these other youngsters and then went on to pick fights with the biggest of the school seniors. Hardly a day passed when I did not, through one means or the other, goad a senior into a fight, 
during which I thoroughly pummeled my adversary. Almost every night I returned to my uncle's home covered with bruises, taking care, however, to keep these adventures secret. The first blow fell after the end of my first year at the Methodist school, when a letter from my teacher informed my uncle that I had been branded as a problem pupil. As best I could, I passed off as unimportant the fights, but made no attempt to discontinue what had become a most satisfying means of proving, to myself at least, that I was better than the older students. The teacher's letters became more frequent and finally, my uncle was summoned to the school for a direct verbal report of my disgraceful conduct. I finished my second year in school almost at the bottom of the list. It was too much for my uncle. He had become increasingly angry in his lectures to me, and now decided finally that there was no further use in continuing my stay in Tokyo. Saburo were his final words. I weary of scolding you, and shall not do so further. Perhaps I am to blame for not supervising you more closely, but whatever the cause, I seem to have made the child of the proud Sakai family into a delinquent. You are to go back to Saga, obviously, he added wryly. Tokyo's life has spoiled you. I could not say one word in defence, for everything he said was true. The blame was all mine, but it did not make my return to Saga in shame any less bitter. I was determined to keep my embarrassment a secret, particularly from my uncle's daughter Hatsuyo, of whom I was very fond. I passed off my departure as a visit to my family in Kyushu. That night, however, as the train glided out of the Tokyo Central Station for the 800-mile trip to Saga, I could not prevent the tears from coming to my eyes. I had failed my family, and I dreaded the return home. I returned as a disgrace to my family, and to the entire village as well. To complicate matters, my home suffered from increased poverty and misery. My mother and my oldest brother tilled the tiny farm from sunup to sundown. They and my three sisters were clad in tattered rags, and the small house in which I had been raised was shockingly neglected. Every person in the village had spurred me on with good wishes when I left for Tokyo they would have a feeling of sharing my success. Now, although I had failed them, no one would reproach me face to face or utter words of anger. Their shame was in their eyes, however, and they turned aside to avoid embarrassment for me. I did not dare to walk through the village because of this reaction of my own people. I could not endure their silent admonitions. To flee this place of disgrace became my most fervent wish. It was then that I recalled a large poster in the Saga railway station calling for volunteers to enlist in the Navy. Enlistment seemed the only way out of an unhappy situation. My mother, having already suffered from my absence for several years, deplored my determination to leave once again, but she could offer no alternative. On May 31st, 1933, I enlisted as a 16-year-old seaman recruit at the Sasebo Naval Base some fifty miles east of my home, was the beginning of a new life of monstrously harsh discipline, of severity beyond my wildest nightmares. It was then that the strict Hagakura code under which I had been raised came to my aid. It is still difficult, if not altogether impossible, for Americans and other Westerners to appreciate the harshness of the discipline under which we then lived in the Navy. The petty officers would not for a moment hesitate to administer the severest beatings to recruits they felt deserving of punishment. Whenever I committed a breach of discipline or an error in training, I was dragged physically from my cot by a petty officer. Stand to the wall, bend down, recruit Sakai, he would roar. I'm doing this to you, not because I hate you, but because I like you and want to make you a good seaman. Bend down, and with that he would swing a large stick of wood, and with every ounce of strength he possessed, would slam it against my upturned bottom. The pain was terrible, the force of the blows unremitting. There was no choice but to grit my teeth and struggle desperately not to cry out. At times I counted up to forty crashing impacts into my buttocks. Often I fainted from the pain, a lapse into unconsciousness constituted no escape, however. The petty officer simply hurled a bucket of cold water over my prostrate form and bellowed for me to resume position, whereupon he continued his discipline until satisfied I would mend the error of my ways. 
To assure that every individual recruit in the station would do his utmost to prevent his fellows from committing too many errors, whenever one of us received a beating, each of the fifty other recruits in the outfit was made to bend down and receive one vicious blow. After such treatment, it was impossible to lie on our backs on our cots. Furthermore, we were never allowed the indulgence of even a single satisfying groan in our misery. Let one single man moan in pain or anguish because of his paternalistic discipline, and to a man every recruit in the outfit would be kicked or dragged from his cot to receive the full course. Obviously, such treatment engendered no fondness for our petty officers, who were absolute tyrants in their own right. The majority were in their thirties, and seemed destined to remain in the rank of petty officers throughout their careers. Their major obsession was to terrorise the new recruits in this case ourselves. We regarded these men as sadistic brutes of the worst sort. Within six months, the incredibly severe training had made human cattle of every one of us. We never dared to question orders, to doubt authority, to do anything but immediately carry out all the commands of our superiors. We were automatons who obeyed without thinking. Recruit training melted into a blur of drilling, studying, training, the vicious swings of the sticks and the always painful buttocks, the bruised and blackened skin, the wincing upon sitting down. When I completed the recruit training course, I was no longer the ambitious and zealous youth who had several years previously left his small farm village to conquer the Tokyo school system. My scholastic failures, the family disgrace, and the recruit discipline all combined effectively to humble me. I recognised the futility of questioning official authority. My egotism had been knocked out of me. But never, while I was in training or later, has my deep-rooted anger at the brutality of the petty officers abated. Upon completion of land training, I was assigned as an apprentice seaman to the battleship Kirishima. Life at sea proved a shock to me. I had thought that, with my initial training behind me, the harsh treatment of my immediate superiors would abate. But it did not. If anything, it was worse than before. All this time I had doggedly maintained my desire to get ahead, to better myself, to rise above the lowly position of a volunteer seaman. I had no more than an hour of free time each day, but into this period of grace I cram a textbook study. My goal was enrolment at a Navy Special Training School. Only thus could a volunteer attain the special skills and techniques so indispensable to promotion. In 1935, I passed successfully the competitive entrance examinations for the Navy Gunners School. Six months later, I had received a promotion to seaman and was assigned to sea duty again, this time to the battleship Haruna, where I worked in one of the main 16-inch gun turrets. Things were improving. After several months aboard the Haruna, I was a non-commissioned officer with the rank of Petty Officer, Third Class. The Imperial Japanese services were divided into two armed forces, the Army and Navy. Both commands operated their individual air fleets, an independent air force was never even considered before or during World War II. Neither were there marines, in the sense that the United States enjoys an autonomous marine corps. Picked elements of the army and navy were trained for amphibious operations and performed the functions of the marine units of foreign powers. In the mid-thirties, all naval flyers received their training at the Navy Flyers School at Tsuchiura, 50 miles northeast of Tokyo. Three classes of students attended the school. Ensigns graduated from the Naval Academy at Itajima in western Japan. Non-commissioned officers already in service, and boys in their teens who were willing to begin their naval careers as student pilots. After Japan engaged in all-out war with the United States, the Navy expanded its pilot training facilities in a desperate attempt to produce combat pilots almost on a production line basis. In 1937, however, this mass training concept was wholly unknown. Pilot training was a highly select affair, and only the most qualified candidates in the entire nation could hope even to be considered. Tsuchiura accepted only a fraction of its applicants. In 1937, the year I applied, only 70 men were selected for the pilot class out of more than 1,500 hopefuls. 
My jubilation knew no bounds when I discovered my name on the list of the 70 non-commissioned officers accepted for training. There was grim satisfaction in my acceptance, for entry to Tsuchiura would wipe out the disgrace of my failure at the Tokyo school. It would return honour to my family and my village, and would vindicate the faith which had been placed in me. My pleasure in returning to my uncle's home in Tokyo on my first holiday leave can well be imagined. No longer was I the frustrated and disobedient teenager afraid to face squarely my scholastic and social problems. I was a young man of twenty, fairly bursting with pride, immaculate in new naval flyers' uniform, bedecked with seven shining buttons, and willing, most willing, to accept happily the congratulations of my uncle's family. The sight of my cousin Hatsuyo startled me. The young schoolgirl had disappeared, and in her place was an exceptionally attractive high school student, fifteen years old. Hatsuyo greeted me with more than family warmth. I had a long discussion with my uncle, who had always displayed such a strong interest in my life, and I was gratified to notice his pleasure at the outcome of my seaman apprenticeship, of studying on my own time, of rising through the ranks. All his pride had returned, no small thing for me after I had failed him so badly in the past. My visit to his home, with the family and Hatsuyo, was one of the most pleasant interludes in many years. After dinner we spent the evening in the sitting room where, after considerable prompting from her family, Hatsuyo honoured me with a piano recital. Hatsuyo was by no means a piano virtuoso, for she had begun her lessons only three years previously. However, I was not a music critic, and her playing seemed beautiful to me. The slow movements of Mozart, my first visit to a home in so many long months, the cordiality of Hatsuyo's greeting were incredibly pleasant. Here for the first time in a seeming eternity was beauty and affection and comfort, in place of the harsh brutality of naval training. The mood was almost overwhelming. The visit, however, was a brief one and I soon returned to the school. The Tsuchiura training facilities were located by a large lake and bordered an airfield with two runways of 3,022 yards. Hundreds of airplanes could be stored at one time within the huge hangars, and there was always the bustle of activity at the base. Apparently, I was never to cease being surprised at what awaited me in each new naval training programme. Hardly had I arrived at the new school than I discovered that my prior experiences with naval discipline were minor ones. I was amazed to realise that the disciplinary customs of the Sasebo Naval Base were pleasant interludes in comparison with those of Tsuchiura. Even the Navy Gunner School was hardly more than a kindergarten alongside the Flyer School. A fighter pilot must be aggressive and tenacious, always. This was our initial greeting from the athletic instructor who called together our first wrestling class. Here at Tsuchiura, we are going to instill those characteristics into you, or else you will never become a Navy pilot. He lost no time in showing us his ideas of how we were to become indoctrinated with constant aggressiveness. The instructor at random selected two students from the group and ordered them to wrestle. The victor of this clash was then allowed to leave the wrestling mat, his opponent, who had lost the important match, had no such luck. He remained on the mat, prepared to take on another pilot trainee. So long as he continued to lose, he remained on that mat, tiring with every bout, slammed about heavily and often sustaining injuries. If necessary, he was forced to wrestle every one of the other 69 students in his class. If, at the end of 69 consecutive wrestling bouts, he was still able to resume standing. He was considered fit, but for only one more day. The following day he again took on the first wrestling opponent and continued until he either emerged a victor or was expelled from the school. With every pilot trainee determined not to be expelled from the flyer's course, the wrestling matches were scenes of fierce competition. Often students were knocked unconscious, this, however, did not excuse them from what was considered an absolute training necessity. They were revived with buckets of water or other means and sent back to the mat. Following a month's basic ground training, we began our primary flying lessons. Flight lessons were held in the morning, classroom and other courses in the afternoon. Following dinner, we had two hours in which to study our subjects until the lights were turned out. As the months wore on, 
Our numbers diminished steadily. The training course demanded perfection from the students, and a trainee could be dismissed for even the slightest infraction of rules. Since the naval pilots were considered the elite of the entire navy, of all the armoured forces, there was no room for error. Before our ten-month course was completed, 45 out of the original 70 students had been expelled from the school. The instructors did not follow the violent physical discipline system of my former training installations, but their authority to dismiss from the school any student, for any reason, was feared far more than any mere savage beating. The rigidity of this weeding-out process was forcibly brought home to us on the very eve of our graduation. On that same day, one of the remaining students was expelled. A shore patrol discovered him entering an off-limits bar in the town of Tsuchiura to celebrate his graduation. He was premature in more respects than one. Upon his return to the billet, he was ordered to report at once to his faculty board. By way of apology, the student knelt on the floor before his officers, but to no avail. The faculty board found him guilty of two unpardonable sins. The first, every pilot knew. That was, that a combat pilot shall never, for any reason, drink alcoholic beverages the evening before he flies. As part of the graduation exercises, we were to pass over the field in formation flight the next day. The second of the two crimes was more commonplace, but equally serious. No member of the Navy was ever to disgrace his service by entering any establishment marked off limits. The physical training courses at Tsuchiura were among the severest in Japan. One of the more unpleasant of the obstacle courses was a high iron pole which we were required to climb. At the top of the pole we were to suspend ourselves by one hand only. Any cadet who failed to support his weight for less than ten minutes received a swift kick in the rear and was sent scurrying up the pole again. At the end of the course, those students who had avoided expulsion were able to hang by one arm for as long as fifteen to twenty minutes. Every enlisted man in the Imperial Navy was required to be able to swim. There were a good number of students who came from the mountain regions and had never done any swimming at all. The training solution was simple. The cadets were trussed up with rope around their waists and tossed into the ocean where they swam or sank. Today, thirty-nine years old and with pieces of shrapnel still in my body, I can swim 50 metres in 34 seconds. At Flyers School, swimming that distance in less than 30 seconds was commonplace. Every student was required to swim underwater for at least 50 metres and to remain below the surface for at least 90 seconds. The average man can, with effort, hold his breath for 40 or 50 seconds, but this is considered inadequate for a Japanese pilot. My own record is 2 minutes and 30 seconds below the surface. We went through hundreds of diving lessons to improve our sense of balance and to aid us later when we would be putting fighter planes through all sorts of aerobatic gyrations. There was special reason to pay strict attention to the diving lessons, for once the instructors felt we had received enough assistance from the boards, we were ordered to dive from a high tower to the hard ground. During the drop we somersaulted two or three teams in the air and landed on our feet. Naturally, there were errors with disastrous results. Acrobatics formed an important part of our athletic instruction, and every requirement laid down by the instructors was fulfilled or the student was expelled. Walking on our hands was considered merely a primer. We also had to balance ourselves on our heads, at first for five minutes, then ten, until finally many of the students could maintain position for fifteen minutes or more. Eventually I was able to balance on my head for more than twenty minutes, during which time my fellow trainees would light cigarettes for me and place them between my lips. Naturally such circus antics were not the only physical requirements of our training, but they did permit us to develop an amazing sense of balance and muscular coordination, traits which were to have life-saving value in later years. Every student at Tsuchiura was gifted with extraordinary eyesight, this was, of course, a minimum entry requirement. Every passing moment we spent in developing our peripheral vision, in learning how to recognise distant objects with snap glances, in short. In developing the techniques which would give us advantages over opposing fighter pilots. One of our favourite tricks was to try to discover the brighter stars during daylight hours. This is no mean feat. 
and without above-average eyes it is virtually impossible to accomplish. However, our instructors constantly impressed us with the fact that a fighter plane seen from a distance of several thousand yards often is no easier to identify than a star in daylight, and the pilot who first discovers his enemy and manoeuvres into the most advantageous attack position can gain an invincible superiority. Gradually, and with much more practice, we became quite adept at our star hunting, then we went further. When we had sighted and fixed the position of a particular star, we jerked our eyes away 90 degrees and snapped back again to see if we could locate the star immediately. Of such things our fighter pilots made, I personally cannot too highly commend this particular activity. Inane as it may seem to those unfamiliar with the split-second life-or-death movements of aerial warfare, I know that during my 200 air engagements with enemy planes, except for two minor errors, I was never caught in a surprise attack by enemy fighters, nor did I ever lose any of my wingmen to hostile pilots. In all our spare moments during our training at Tsuchiura, we sought constantly to find methods by which we could shorten our reaction time and improve our certainty of movement. A favourite trick of ours was to snatch a fly on the wing within our fists. We must have looked silly pawing at the air with our hands, but after several months a fly which flew before our faces was almost certain to end up in our hands. The ability to make sudden and exact movements is indispensable within the cramped confines of a fighter plane cockpit. These improvements in reaction time came to our aid in a totally unexpected way. Four of us were racing in a car at 60 miles an hour along a narrow road, when the driver lost control of the car and hurtled over the edge of an embankment. The four of us, to a man, snapped open the car doors and literally flew from the vehicle. There were some scrapes and bruises, but not a single major injury among us, although the car was thoroughly demolished. The 25 students of the 38th non-commissioned officers' class, including myself, graduated near the end of 1937. I was selected as the Outstanding Student Pilot of the Year to receive as an award the Emperor's Silver Watch. Our group of 25 men was all which remained of 70 students, hand-picked out of 1,500 applicants. We had undergone intensive and often gruelling training. However, before we were to be committed to action in China, where the war was launched in July of 1937, we were to receive additional in-service training. Despite our excellent and arduous instruction, several men from my group were later killed by enemy pilots before gaining even a single victory. Even I, with unusual flying aptitude, would have met death during my first air combat if my opponent had been even slightly more aggressive in his manoeuvres. There can be no doubt that I faltered clumsily through my first dogfight, and nothing less than the support of my fellow pilots and a lack of skill on the part of my enemy saved my life. To me, a dogfight has always been a difficult, gruelling task, with almost unbearable tension. Even after my first combats were behind me and I had several enemy planes to my credit, I never emerged from the wild aerial melees without being soaked in perspiration. There was always the chance of committing that one slight error which meant flaming death. Through all the aerial manoeuvres, the vertical turns, stalling turns, spins, half-rolls, rolls, slow rolls, spirals, loops, immelmans, dives, zooms, falling leaves, through all these and more, one slight error could bring extinction. Of my twenty-five-man class, eventually I was the only man left alive. The long and difficult air war, so much to our advantage in the early days, degenerated into a vicious nightmare in which we struggled hopelessly against a rising enemy tide impossible to overcome. During the 1930s, the Japanese Navy trained approximately 100 flyers every year. The rigid screening and expulsion practices reduced the many hundreds of qualified students to the ridiculously low total of 100 or fewer graduated pilots. Had the Navy received additional funds for its training programme, and had it eased its intolerant attitude towards selecting pilot trainees. I believe our path during World War II would have been eased considerably. Doubtless the outcome would have been unaltered, but the brutal beating suffered by our air units during the last two years of war might have been somewhat alleviated. Only after the war began in the Pacific, 
and the attrition of experienced pilots emphasised the alarming need for an increased flow of replacements, did the Navy abandon its unreasonable training policies? By then, it was too late. The calibre of the pilots produced during the wartime years was at best questionable. I know that the 45 pilots expelled from my own student class at Tsuchiura were superior to those men who completed wartime training. Our graduation was followed with assignment to various air squadrons for service training. My orders sent me to Oita and Amura Naval Air Bases in northern Kyushu. Both installations stressed flying from landfields as well as from aircraft carriers. My introduction to the skill of the carrier pilots left me fairly quaking. Their aerobatics were astonishing and were carried out with the most consummate skill. I doubted my own ability, even after years of training, to duplicate their superb airmanship. Carrier landings proved particularly difficult for me to master. A month's hard grind of approaches and touchdowns, approaches and touchdowns, over and over again, dispelled my troubles. Strangely enough, after this training, I never took off or landed on a carrier in combat. All my combat flying was done from land installations. Following three months of intensive carrier and land training, I received orders to transfer to the Kaohsiung Air Base on Formosa Island, then Japanese territory. The tempo of naval life had changed. The China War was already raging over sprawling battlefronts, and there was a sudden urgent need for more fighter pilots, even green pilots such as myself. From Formosa, I moved up to Qiuqiang in southeastern China, and in May of 1938, I tasted my first combat with hardly an auspicious start. The Kyukyang wing commander disdained the use of green pilots in regular air sorties, feeling that their inexperience would mark them clearly to the veteran pilots flying for the Chinese. So, for several days, I flew low-level missions in support of army operations. The sorties were anything but dangerous. The Japanese army was smashing aside all enemy opposition on the ground, and there was little opposition in the air. As the weeks passed, I chafed at my restriction to support flights only. I was Silus and Ambitius, proof of my rank as a naval aviation pilot, second class, and determined to storm into enemy aircraft with great valour. On May 21st, I was overjoyed to find my name among the 15 fighter pilots selected to fly over Hankou on a regular patrol the following day. Hankou promised action since it was the main airbase of nationalist China at the time. In 1938, the Zero fighter plane, which I later came to know so well, was not yet available for combat use. We flew the Mitsubishi Type 96 fighter plane, later given the Allied codename identification of Claude. These were slow and restricted in range, the landing gear was fixed, and we flew with open cockpits. Our 15 fighters left Qiuqiang early on the morning of the 22nd, adopting a formation of five Vs as we climbed. Visibility was excellent. The 90-minute flight from our airbase northwest to Hankou was like a leisurely training cruise. No interceptors arose to attack our formation, and not a single anti-aircraft gun disputed the air with us. It seemed incredible that a war raged below. From 10,000 feet, the Hankou airfield was remarkably deceptive. Bright green grass stood out clearly under the morning sun, and the enemy's major airbase in the area looked for all the world like a sprawling, well-tended golf course. But fighter planes do not use such sporting facilities, and those three dots I saw racing over the ground, rising toward our own planes, were enemy fighters. Then suddenly they were at our altitude, big, black, and powerful. Without warning to my astonished mind, at least one of the enemy planes whipped out of his formation and bored in with alarming speed at my own fighter. Abruptly, all my careful plans of what I would do in my first combat evaporated. I felt my overtaught muscles twitch nervously, and, although it is unpleasant to relate this now, I am certain I trembled with excitement and the shock of the other plane, using me for his target. I have often believed that I acted stupidly during those crucial moments, and the listener may well share this opinion. I must emphasise, however, that our mental reactions at 10,000 feet, after some 90 minutes at this height without oxygen, were hardly as reliable as when we were on the ground. The air is thin, 
with correspondingly less oxygen reaching the brain. The engine noise in the open cockpit is deafening, as is the streaming cold wind racing past the glass windshield, and there is no such thing as relaxing at the controls. I was turning my head, trying frantically to look in all directions to avoid being caught unawares. Working the control stick, the rudder pedals, the throttle, and other controls and instruments. In short, I was completely confused. The habits instilled during my training came to my aid. And the one instruction which overrode all others for the fledgling in combat was, always stick to the tail of the lead fighter in your V formation. In a blur of hand movements, I tightened the straps on my oxygen mask. With only two hours oxygen supply, we used the masks only in combat or during flight above 10,000 feet and shoved the throttle as far forward as it would go. The engine responded with a roar and the little fighter leaped ahead. All about me fuel cells tumbled wildly through the air as the other Japanese pilots jerked the cockpit toggles. I had completely forgotten to jettison the highly explosive tank below my fuselage and my hand trembled as I reached out to hit the lever. Mine was the last to drop free. By now I was completely upset. I had done everything in a slipshod fashion, had ignored almost all the basic rules of aerial combat. I failed to see anything going on to the sides or behind me. I couldn't see a single enemy plane and had not the slightest idea whether or not I was being shot at. All I saw was the tail of my leader's plane. In desperation I swung after his fighter, my plane looking for all the world as if it were tied to the other. When finally I had swung into the proper wingman position, behind and to the side of the lead fighter, I regained my senses and no longer fumbled around clumsily in the cockpit. Taking a deep breath, I chanced a quick look to the left, none too soon. Two sleek enemy fighters raced in against my plane. They were Russian-made E-16s with retractable landing gear. Higher powered than our own clawed fighters, the E-16s were also faster and more manoeuvrable. Again I faltered, and in that second I was given a new lease on life. My hands hesitated in the air. I actually didn't know what to do next. Instead of snapping away to the side or clawing for altitude, I simply continued flying as before. By all the rules of air war, I should have met my end at that moment. But, unexpectedly, when they had me dead in their sights, the two Russian fighters rolled over and away. For the life of me, I could not understand this miraculous turn of fortune. The solution was simple enough, anticipating that I might fumble with my controls in my first combat as I did. The flight leader had assigned one of the veteran pilots to cover my plane from behind. It was his fighter, whipping about in a tight turn and plunging at the enemy planes, which caused them to break off their attack, and still I was incapable of any original action. I came out of a death trap, flying blindly, not even realising that the abrupt change of position had placed my fighter 450 yards to the rear of one of the fleeing Russian planes. I simply sat in my cockpit, trying to reason with myself, trying to do something, at last, I broke out of my stupor and reached forward. I had the Russian fighter dead in my sights and squeezed the gun trigger. Nothing happened. I jerked the trigger back and forth, cursing the two jammed machine guns until, with acute embarrassment, I noticed that I had failed to complete arming the guns before engaging with the enemy planes. The petty officer flying the fighter to my left finally gave up in despair when he saw me fumbling in the cockpit and forged ahead firing at the escaping enemy fighter. The burst didn't take the E-16, which had steadily been veering to the right, fortunately for me, only 200 yards in front of my own guns. This time I was ready and jammed down on the trigger. The shells arced out but were wasted. I had lost another golden opportunity. This time I swore I would shoot down the Russian plane if I had to close in and ram. Under full throttle I narrowed the distance between the two fighters. The enemy pilot rolled, looped and spiralled in violent manoeuvres, successfully evading every burst I fired at him. His sharp turns and attempts to catch me in his own sights were surprisingly poor flying. His own tracers scattered wildly through the air. Actually, the enemy never had a chance. I was unaware of it, 
but several of the other Claudes circled high over our individual dogfight, prepared at a moment's notice to plunge down upon the Russian fighter should I be caught in a dangerous situation. This the enemy knew, and concentrated his attention primarily on escape, rather than on my destruction, it was his undoing. I came out of a tight loop to find the E-16 only 150 yards ahead of me and poured bullets into the fighter's engine. The next moment, oily black smoke gushed from the nose and the plane plunged earthward. Not until the enemy fighter erupted into mushrooming wreckage far below did. I realise I had exhausted all my ammunition, something else I had been warned not to do. Every fighter pilot did his utmost to retain some ammunition for his return flight in the event he was caught by patrolling enemy fighters. I looked frantically about me, searching for the other Mitsubishis, and felt my heart drop when I discovered myself to be entirely alone in the air. I had strayed from the group. My victory was little more than a hollow mockery, for it had been given to me on a silver platter by my wingmates, the same men I had lost in pursuing the Russian plane. My humiliation at my own absurd actions virtually choked me, and I was close to actually bursting into tears. And that is exactly what I did do when, after looking around again, I saw fourteen Claudes circling slowly in formation, waiting patiently for me to gain my bearings and to join them. I think that for five minutes I must have cried with shame. At Kukiang again, I climbed exhausted from my cockpit, my flight commander stormed up to my plane in a rage, his face flushed from his anger. Sakai, of all they, he spluttered, you are a damned fool, Sakai. It is a miracle you are alive at all. I have never seen such clumsy or ridiculous flying in all my entire life. You? He couldn't go on. I stared down at the ground, sorry and penitent. Indeed, I hoped, I fairly prayed, he would lose his temper and in his rage kick and beat me. But he was too angry for physical violence. The captain did the worst thing possible. He turned his back on me and walked away. To this day we cannot prove the nationality of the enemy flyers who piloted China's Russian-made fighters. There was good reason to believe that Russian volunteers accompanied the Soviet aircraft across the border. But we failed ever to recover from the wreckage of the enemy planes the body of a Russian pilot. Our Navy had strong evidence that a foreign legion of pilots manned China's air force. These men from all nations flew a mixed conglomeration of fighter plane types, for we met in the air not only Russian planes, but those of American, British, German and other manufacturers as well. Sometimes, of course, Chinese nationals were flying these aircraft, proof positive that an American pilot was flying, an American-built fighter was established when the airplane crashed near Shanghai. Our troops rushed quickly to the site of the wreck and returned with the pilot's body. His papers identified him conclusively as American. My own victory over the Soviet fighter soon overcame the dejection caused by my poor combat performance. The day following the flight, I lost no time in painting a blue star on the fuselage of the Claude fighter, for a total of six stars on the airplane. The Japanese pilots, especially enlisted men as myself, did not fly the same plane on each mission. There were not enough fighters to go around, and we took whatever ships were available when it was our time to fly. More than once this arrangement came to the aid of an inexperienced pilot. Enemy fleers, upon sighting the dozen or more blue stars on the fuselage, wanted no part of a plane with a double or triple ace at the controls, so they thought. The conflict in China was an incredible war. Among our forces it was never referred to as a war but rather as the Sino-Japanese incident. I suppose the same situation existed when America threw so much military strength into Korea. Since the American Congress had not officially declared war, it was a police action. Many years prior to this modern struggle, our government felt precisely the same way. We had not actually declared war, therefore it was an incident. As soon as it was feasible, we instituted a puppet government under Wang Qingwei, a prominent Chinese who had split openly with Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek's Kuomintang, or Nationalist Party. The most startling aspect of the conflict, however, was the savage internal struggle between Chiang's forces and those of the communist Chinese. 
At every opportunity the latter would strike at nationalist forces when they were retreating before our own troops. Opposing the Japanese land and air forces in China were vast enemy armies of millions of men, hopelessly outnumbering our own troops. This disparity in numbers, however, rarely worked to the Chinese advantage, for their troops were poorly trained and ill-equipped. Time after time hordes of enemy troops would advance against our well-armed forces, only to be thrown back with shattering losses. Even the flood of Allied assistance to China in the form of supplies rushed through Burma, Mongolia and Xinjiang failed to offset our qualitative superiority. These supplies helped the enemy, of course, especially in permitting Chiang to effect an orderly withdrawal to Chongqing, but never allowed him to mount any worthwhile offensive against us. It was strictly a one-sided war until the Japanese surrender to the Allies in August of 1945. This does not mean, however, that Japan ever conquered or attempted to conquer the vast Chinese population or to occupy its tremendous land area. This would have been absolutely impossible. Instead, our troops occupied key walled towns at strategic areas, cutting enemy communications, and then exacted tolls and taxes from the millions of Chinese peasants within the authority of the occupying Japanese forces. But outside the protection of these major walled towns, violent death awaited all but the most powerful Japanese formations. Chiang's guerrillas, as well as those of the Chinese communists, waited in savage ambush where they would do their utmost to annihilate those troops which fell into their hands. It also was obvious to our officers that those Chinese officials within the occupied cities, despite their fawning and seeming cooperation, remained in constant touch with agents of the guerrilla bands roaming the open countryside and the mountains, and in many instances to facilitate the problems of occupying enemy cities, such contacts were maintained with the direct acquiescence of the Japanese commanders. It was, indeed, a strange war. Many times I flew land support missions and was astonished at the sights below me. I saw Chinese farmers tilling their farms, paying no attention to pitched hand-to-hand -hand battles or blazing firefights between Chinese and Japanese troops less than a mile away. On several occasions, I flew low over the streets of walled towns that were surrounded and under fierce bombardment by our artillery. On those streets, rows of stores were operating under business-as-usual conditions, although the blood of the defending Chinese garrison stained the streets red. For the Japanese air units, however, China duty was by no means hard or unpleasant. It was strictly an air war waged in our favour. Sixteen months after my arrival at Qiang, our ground forces stabbed deeply into enemy territory and secured for us the more elaborate airfield installations at Hankou. The entire unit moved up the line. By now the newspapers in Japan had reported the details of my first victory over an enemy fighter. A letter arrived from my mother, and the pride in her words was balm indeed. Of almost equal interest was a letter from Hatsuyo Hirokawa, my uncle's daughter, now sixteen years old. She wrote, Recently my father was appointed the postmaster here in Tokushima, Shikoku. I am now studying in the Tokushima Girls High School, and you can imagine that it is a big change from Tokyo. Your letter thrilled me. It brought great pleasure to all my classmates. Every day we pour through the newspapers in search of more news about you. We want to be sure that we do not overlook any news about your air victorias in China. Incidentally, Saburo, I wish to introduce to you my closest friend here in Tokushima, Mikiko Niori. Mikiko is the most beautiful girl in my class, and she is also the brightest. Her father is a professor in Kobe College. Of all my classmates to whom I showed your letter, she was the most excited, and she has begged me to introduce her to you. The letter included a picture of Hatsuyo and Mikiko together, and also a letter from this girl I had never met. She was certainly as pretty as Hatsuyo claimed, and it was interesting to read her charming description of her town and of her family. The letters from home were a tremendous boon to my morale, and I went about my work singing. I remember the day with absolute clarity, October 3rd, 1939. 
I had just finished reading my mail and was servicing the machine guns of my fighter plane. Everyone at the field was relaxed. What was there to worry about? We had whipped the Chinese and international pilots in almost every combat. Abruptly, the silence was broken by frenzied shouts from the control tower. In the next instant, without any further warning, the world erupted into a series of shattering roars. The earth heaved and shook, and blast waves smashed at our startled ears. Someone bellowed unnecessarily air raid, and then the sirens shrieked a useless, belated warning. There was no time to try to run for shelters. The blasting crescendo of exploding bombs was a constant thunder now. Smoke rose over the field, and I heard the shrill scream, bomb fragments cutting through the air. Several other pilots ran frantically with me from the machine shop shelter. I crouched low to escape the whistling pieces of steel and dove headlong onto the ground between two big water tanks. I was none too soon. A nearby machine gun storage shed went up in a roaring blast of fire and smoke, and then a stick of bombs walked across the field, hammering at our ears, sending up great spouts of smoke and earth. A second's delay in diving for the ground would have meant my end. The nearby series of bomb explosions suddenly ended and I lifted my head to see what had happened. Above the steady crump of bombs exploding all across the field, I heard anguished cries and groans. The men lying all about me had been badly wounded and I started to crawl toward the nearest pilot when I gasped from a knife-like pain in my thighs and buttocks. I reached down with my hand and felt the blood seeping through my trousers. The pain was bad, but fortunately... The wounds were not deep, and then I lost my head. I was on my feet and running again, but this time I ran back toward the airstrip, glancing up at the sky as I moved down the runway. Overhead I saw twelve bombers in formation, very high, wheeling about in a wide turn at a height of at least 20,000 feet. They were Russian SB twin-engine planes, the main bombers of the Chinese Air Force and there was no denying the incredible effectiveness of their sudden surprise attack, we had been caught totally unprepared. Not a single man had any warning until the bombs were actually released from the Russian planes and shrieking in their descent. What I saw on the airfield itself was a shock. The majority of the 200 Navy and Army bombers and fighters parked wing to wing on the long runways were burning. Great sheets of flame burst outward from the exploding fuel tanks, sending billowing clouds of smoke into the air. Those planes, still safe from the flames, were leaking gasoline from shrapnel holes in their fuselages. The flames travelled from one plane to the other, fed upon the dripping gasoline, and one by one long rows of bombers and fighters mushroomed into blinding crimson. Bombers were exploding like firecrackers, and the fighters flared like matchboxes. I ran around the burning planes as if I were crazed, seeking desperately just one undamaged fighter. Miraculously, a few clauds in a separate group had escaped the carnage, and I clambered into the cockpit of one plane, started the engine, and without waiting for it to warm up, gunned the fighter down the runway. The bombers were gaining height gradually, as my faster steadily overtook their formation. I held the throttle against the firewall, coaxing every bit of speed from the protesting Mitsubishi. And, twenty minutes after takeoff, I was almost up to the enemy planes, climbing steadily so that I could open fire into the unprotected bellies of the bombers. I paid little attention to the fact that I was the only fighter plane in the air. It was obvious to me that the lightly armed Claude could not by itself prove a serious threat to the twelve bombers. Below me was the city of Ichang on the Yangtze River, still held by defending Chinese troops, being shot down here, even if I escaped death in a crash, meant certain and horrible death at the hands of Chiang's men, but there was no delaying the attack. This was why I had been raised in the samurai tradition, and there was no thought other than to wreak all the damage I could. I closed in from behind and below the trailing bomber of the formation, not without notice by the enemy, as the flickering guns in the tail proved. The enemy gunner failed to hit the Claude and I pressed as close as possible to the plane, concentrating my fire against the left engine. As I passed by and climbed above the bomber, I noticed smoke trailing from the engine I had worked over. 
the bomber dropped out of formation and began losing altitude as I swung into a diving turn to finish off the cripple. But I never followed the advantage, even as I pushed the stick forward to go into a shallow dive, I remember that Ichang was at least 150 miles west of Hanko. Any additional flight in pursuing the bomber meant that I would not have enough fuel to return to base and would mean a forced landing in enemy territory. There is a difference between risking battle against great odds and in throwing away a life and an airplane. To continue the attack would be suicide, and there was no call for drastic action of that sort. I turned for home. Whether or not the Russian bomber reached its own field successfully, I do not know, of course, but at the worst it would have crashed among friendly troops. Back at Hankow, the terrible destruction wrought by only twelve enemy planes was incredible. Almost all of our planes had been destroyed or wrecked. The commander of the base lost his left arm, and several of his lieutenants, as well as pilots and maintenance crews, were killed or maimed. I had forgotten my own wounds. The heat of the pursuit and my battle excitement had overcome the pain temporarily. I walked a few feet from my airplane and collapsed on the runway. The wounds healed slowly.